This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. Let's go. In 2018, we made something that you didn't like. So in 2019, we made a top 10 Watch Mojo video. <laughs> yep. That will fix it. Here, chat, you can be included a little louder. Sorry. The clip you just heard comes from Iman Anis, a Moroccan-Canadian internet personality better known as Pokemon. Anis started as an engineering student at McMaster University, but decided to shift to the internet, where she's earned millions of dollars on Twitch and has a huge following on YouTube and Instagram. In this clip, she's watching and talking about a video from Watch Mojo, one of the most successful YouTube channels that happens to be based in Montreal. The Canadian digital first creator economy isn't something that politicians or policymakers seem to know much about, yet they're quick to propose legislative reforms that directly implicate it, most recently in the form of Bill C-10. Scott Benzie is the CEO of Buffer Festival. He started in traditional media, but now advocates and works with creators, platforms, and industry around online content. He joins me on the podcast to discuss the current state of digital first creators in Canada, their omission from the Bill C-10 process, and what the community would like to see going forward. Scott, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Uh, Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really glad that you, you've taken the time out to join. You know, there's a lot to discuss, certainly when it comes to Bill C-10, digital creators, and and what lies ahead in the coming months. But before we get into all of these d- different issues, why don't we start a little bit about you and what brought you to these issues? Yeah, a real roundabout way, and I'll try and be as condensed as possible. Um, you know, my group, we run a, a festival here in Toronto called Buffer Festival, which is, a, you know, we, it's, a, it's essentially a film festival for elevated content on YouTube. And our, our group came in and took that over, I guess, six years ago now, seven years ago now. Um, it, it evolved out of that to us working with brands and creators on best practices and working with governments and, you know, having roundabout policy discussions um, on, you know, on the effects of, um, the digital economy, um, working in between creators and platforms um, and helping those relationships and really just, you know, doing workshops and best practices and celebrating all, all things digital content. Um, you know, that, that kind of evolved when getting to C10 and how we got involved in C10 as, as soon as, I know we'll get into it, but as soon as Clause 4.1 was removed from the bill, um, some of our more astute um, colleagues kind of raised a flag and said, whoa, 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 um, this isn't good. We need to get involved. So that's when I started doing my outreach um, to policymakers, to the opposition. Um, and while it was late and post witnesses, um, we managed to get some comments read into the record. And I wrote that blog, which um, certainly ruffled a few fe- ruffled a few feathers. And and here we are. We're, we're in C10. We are... Um, you know, we're, we're fighting the good fight on behalf of digital first creators and, you know, digital first content. Yeah, no, you certainly became vocal um, as things progressed uh, over the course of the spring. You know, for many years, lobbying on behalf of the creative sector in Canada has been dominated, I think, quite literally by a handful of organizations, a couple of copyright collectives, the established actor unions, the CMPA, and I suppose the major broadcasters uh, often involve, you know, those voices rarely invoke the interests of digital first creators. Uh, in fact, I think it's fair to say that until recently, it seemed like those creators were largely ignored or uh, more, but more charitably politicians and policymakers perhaps didn't even know of their existence. I mean, they just weren't the sorts that were coming into their offices to lobby on certain issues. Can you fill in the background a little bit? You know, what does the Canadian digital first creator ecosystem look like? Who are, who are we talking about? What, you know, what kind of revenues are involved? What platforms are used? Um, what's the elevator pitch talking about where things stand right now when it comes to Canadian digital first creators? Yeah, I, I think there's two points there, and I'll tackle the second one first. Um, you know, what is a, a Canadian digital first creator is uh, 
that question itself is one of the inherent problems that, that people have tried to apply this broad stroke of what a digital first creator is, is somebody who makes video on YouTube. Um, and, that, and that's not the case. You know, we're talking about tens of thousands, if not millions, probably millions of people in Canada that apply their work or apply their art online. And that's everything from YouTube to TikTok to Snapchat um, to podcasts to, you know, uh, behind the gate websites to third party journalism, journalism organizations. I mean, they're all digital first creators and the scope of, of the type of work we're talking about can't be understated. Um, everything from, you know, if you, you take some of the biggest creators in Canada, like Watch Mojo, um, Super Simple Songs, and and Valnet, certainly, um, you know, those are relatively large organizations with employees. And then there's the individual video creator, um, you know, Call Me Chris in Vancouver, who's doing her thing on TikTok with a phone. Um, and then there's up and coming creators. It's a very, it's a very, very wide industry in itself, much like the traditional industry is. I mean, you, you know, you have students in film school. Would, would you call them part of the traditional industry? Um, much like somebody who's just vlogging in their basement. So, you know, when, when we talk about who these people are, they're everybody. Um, some of them generate a lot of revenue. Some of them generate a little bit of revenue. Some of them do this as a hobby. Uh, but I will say that they represent almost all export success uh, for Canadian content and certainly represent all the top artists that we've seen in the last 15 years that come out of this country. That's without really without sorry, union man. support or help, by the way, um, you know, you, the, the, the first part of your question, the organizations, you know, digital first creators have existed outside of these organizations forever and will continue to because there's no value in them for the digital first creator. They don't need them to, you know, to be discovered. And I'm sure we'll talk about discovery a little bit, but all those organizations can do is hurt more than help. That's, you know, that, it's really interesting to hear both this notion that, that so much of the export is coming from these creators and at the same time that the established players can't do very much for them. Can you unpack a little, that a little bit for me? You know, what, what are we talking about in terms of the kind of viewership and the kind of impact that some of these creators are having both domestically and perhaps even more around the world. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, if you talk about there, there's, there's two different types of what I'll call the successful export uh, for the Canadian creator. There are ch certain channels like watch mojo and super simple songs. Like I mentioned, we're talking about billions of views, billions and billions and billions of views you know, we celebrate the success of Schitt's Creek and it is a great show. Um, you know, those channels do um, more people watch those channels every week than have ever seen a Schitt's Creek episode. Um, I haven't done the actual math, but I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I'll stand by by that statement. Um, you know, you're talking about Canada's most successful photographer is probably Peter McKinnon. Um Canada's most successful music, music artists the last 15 years have all been discovered online. Uh, Justin Bieber, Alessia Cara, Sean Mendez. Uh, obviously, there are ex exceptions to the rule, but if you go down the list of you know, great Canadian exports over the last 15 years, they are almost all um, outside of what I would call the, tr the traditional system. And you know, back to the first point of why can't um, the, you know, the traditional me media, you know, why can't they work with them? Why can't they figure it out? I would say that traditional media thinks a lot more about the digital creator than the digital creator thinks about traditional media. Um, you know, there are very few digital first creators that aspire to have a show on Bell or CBC. Uh, the reach is just not far enough. You know, there are gates in place and whether or not those gates um, should be in place are, are, is debatable, but there's really just no value in those organizations that they can provide to the digital first creator to help them achieve a different level of success when the discovery of the platforms themselves is, are doing such a great job. Wow. The, that too is, I think, a pretty remarkable statement. I, let, let's unpack. I, 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 there's a, a lot I want to get to, but I just want to sure. unpack that even just a little further. So, you know, you, you highlight some, some major success stories and the idea that, that they, that they take a look at a conventional broadcaster, a conventional Canadian a distributor and say, you just don't have a lot there for me. Is that from an economic perspective, they're able to do better by utilizing these platforms and going after a global audience? Is that simply in terms of what the viewership and the audience engagement looks like that you've got Canadian 
uh, entities that tend to be a bit more inward looking and they tend to be as creators more outward looking and are looking for platforms to do that. Um, how, how does that play out? Yeah. So I think, you know, there's, there's um, two things can be true at once. There are exceptions to this rule, but I was talking to a creator last week uh, who has worked a lot with one of the traditional broadcasters and has her own channel and is a very successful channel. Um, and she was talking about how a year ago she was bummed that she didn't get uh, didn't get a show uh, on it was the CBC on the CBC and she was bummed and then she went back and looked at one of her worst performing videos of, of, of that year and it was like quadruple the audience of that show once it was released. Um, so there is definitely a when we talk about you know Canadian digital first content creators, they look at an audience from a global perspective. Canada is such a small piece of the pie that it's almost irrelevant. It's certainly uh, irrelevant in your analytics. And if you look at some of the, you know, the top creators, uh, I would say that they, first of all, definitely make more money online. Um, and this goes for YouTubers and TikTokers um, and you know, people building Snapchat filters um, and, and podcasters. There's def definitely a bigger pie in the global audience. But also, you know, the traditional broadcasters, when they try to tap into... Canadian talent, uh, Canadian digital first talent, it's always done incorrectly. It's like, let's take your character that you've made successful on YouTube and give them a show. Um, you know, that's worked with Letterkenny, you know, Bell Media's flagship channel is basically characters that were discovered online. Um, but, but it doesn't work on the whole, you know, you can hire talent and let them be talented, you know, let them be editors, let them be comedy writers, let them do that. But you can't just take a character and drop it into a traditional environment and expect it to succeed. And we saw that with Miranda scenes and Netflix, um, you know, it was relatively unsuccessful it lasted two seasons, but, you know, an, an online audience doesn't want to travel to traditional broadcasters to watch what they want to watch. Um, and that goes to the nature of the platforms where, um, you know, a, a platform is user-based, right? Like it's uh, the, the, the platform, rightly or wrongly, is going to be recommending content that I want, where traditional broadcasters are saying, here, we're making this content, you watch it. And that's really what it boils down to for the creator. They have a much better chance of success without that, um, you know, without that uh, process in place of creation. You know, th there's a bit of divide at times, or at least the perception of a two solitudes and a divide between English Canada and French Canada, French speaking Canada and Quebec in particular, of course, when it comes to some of this cultural policy, you know, do, do you see the same thing taking place online or are there, you know, what's, what does the digital first creator landscape look like in French from a Canadian perspective? Yeah. So interestingly enough and not shocking, um, there are some disagreements um, in not even disagreements. It's just, there are some different views, I guess, on, you know, on the landscape and on the culture. We work with a lot of Francophone creators. We have a lot of Francophone creators on our board. Um, and, you know, I think there's a look, there's a locality issue in Quebec that isn't experienced anywhere else in Canada, which makes it unique for digital first creators. I will say this for Quebec creators. And I, you know, I would happily introduce you to one to have the conversation with them. Um, they, they can speak to it better than I do. But, you know, they had, uh, let's say, 70 to 80 percent. And again, don't this is a small sample size of the, the few creators that I've talked to of their audience in Quebec is local, especially if you're French speaking. Right. Um, so there is some value perceived in having your local content promoted locally. And that's actually created some, you know, some interesting conversations about whether or not there's a, should you opt in to have your content show, shown locally online? Um, but also there's a bulk of content from these, from the French creators that is viewed from France and from the U.S. And one of the things we haven't talked about here is there's a real fear that if Canada takes the step that we expect fair and equal, you know, fair and equal treatment abroad. So we're going to prioritize Canadian content in Canada but not expect uh, France or the U.S. or anywhere else to turn around and say, well, OK, well, you know, we'll give preference to our content. And that would kill any Canadian content creator, again, because the, the Canada pie is just not big enough. Um, I will say this about Quebec, though. Two of the three largest YouTube channels in Canada are based out of Quebec. 
know, Watch Mojo and Valnet, which does um, Screen Rant and the Richest. Um, you know, well, not not French speaking per se. They are two of Canada's largest YouTube channels. There's a great um, there's a great short filmmaking uh, community in in Quebec. The TikTok in Quebec is huge, and they do great content on TikTok. I just don't think even, you know, hopefully French creators agree. And I know some of them do. The answer isn't to manipulate the algorithm, to have your content shown, um, uh, manipulated to an audience, because that's never going to work. The way this works is users want, want your content. Google feeds it to them. They like it. And that's true across country, language, void. Um, so the, the French, the long way to answer your question, the French digital first content creator has a, about as much in common with the traditional media in Quebec as the rest of Canada digital content creator has with the traditional media in Canada. They are different stories. They are different needs, but there is a, you know, there is a different with the difference of opinion within the digital first community as well um, be- between the two cultures. And I think that's fair. They are different cultures. It's interesting. Now, the, so much of the debate, you know, just tends to flip flop between on the one hand, the, economic drivers and on the other hand the cultural ones and so you you know when the point is made that there's never been more investment taking place right now on film and tv production in canada the response that you get from uh, those that are advocating for things like c10 or for the btlr is that yeah well that's nice but that doesn't really address the cultural dimension here and there are broader goals of canadian voices and you know so-called canadian stories you know how, how do you think that fits that narrative fits within the digital creator world yeah well it's uh, it, it's a bit of an asinine comment quite frankly if you look at what the dig- digital platforms have made available um, to Canadian content creators we've already solved the problem that traditional broadcasters are trying to solve with you know more Canadian voices um, indigenous creators on TikTok have a huge following um, they're remarkably successful um, you know, uh, LGBTQ content uh, on YouTube, everybody gets a chance to find their niche. You know, there are trans creators like Steph Sanyadi, who's a gamer, and Julie Vu out in Vancouver. Um, you know, there are diversity barriers and Canadian story barriers that are put in place in traditional media that uh, the, plat- the platforms have already enabled Canadian content creators to smash. So, when, you know, when, the, when, when big culture in Canada talks about the need to put put these programs in place to enable more Canadian voices. What what they really mean is we need to put these programs in place so that we can tell you what a Canadian voice is. And, you know, I, there's a larger discussion to be had about what is Canadian content and what can be deemed as CanCon. Um, And I, I don't think the answer is what traditional media wants to hear because as the content creators are getting younger um, and their stories are, being told from their own mouths. Um, I I think the power in doing that and the power in telling Canadian stories definitely lies in platforms and not in, you know, gate, gate, gate kept media and union organizations. Okay. Why why don't we go there? Actually, the issue around uh, CanCon certification and, and the world in which things are effectively certified as being genuinely so-called Canadian, you know, much of the, cultural policy discussion, you certainly saw it around C10 and, and, and saw it before then, is framed around the need for this funding for the survival of Canadian stories. And you just made the case, obviously, that, that these Canadian stories, these Canadian voices are out there. Um, and in fact, they're, they're thriving in ways that they haven't before. Can this be made to fit within the, the kind of system that involves you know, CanCon certification involves the CRTC as a regulator, involves a number of other players. Are the are the creators well suited for it? Are the platforms themselves well suited for it? We heard from some um, after when the C10 debate really picked up, saying, "Oh yeah, you can just fit this in using some of the same kind of metrics." Others were more skeptical. Uh, what do you think? I mean, without without wholesale changes, um, the current can can con system cannot be applied to digital first creators. Um, you, you know, parking the fact that the can con system today is broken on a number of levels where, you know, I, I think you have astutely pointed out before that handmaid's tale is not can con, but somehow Vikings is, 
Um, you know, CanCon is really just a, a mechanism for access to funding uh, for creators. It actually has nothing to do with the content of, of the content of the content, a bit of a misnomer, but um, all that said, you know, the current, the current system, and I think it was Minister, Minister Manley that pointed it out a lot, um, doesn't work for a number of reasons. One, you have to be incorporated to, to be able to be certified as CanCon. Two, you have to get every piece of content certified. So while that might work if you're making a feature film once a year or a album once a year, how does that work for the gamer or the daily vlogger where every day they have to apply to get their, to get their content certified as CanCon? Um, and you can't, you know, you can't certify the content creator as, as, as CanCon today, but it, it really is kind of irrelevant unless, um, you know, unless something like C10 passes and CanCon is used as a benchmark for, for what kind of content gets algorithmic preference. You know, I don't think Canadian digital first Canadian content creators care until, until that becomes an issue. So to answer your question, no, CanCon absolutely does not work for digital first creators. I would argue it doesn't work for anybody. Um, and two, you know, it really is just a mechanism for gaining, you know, money through the CM, CMF and the CRTC, which digital first content creators have never been allowed to get anyway. So uh, fair enough with digital first creators, though. Surely it works for someone. Uh, otherwise, certain groups wouldn't be lobbying for it, though, no? Well, yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, if you are in order, you know, some of those points and check marks that are in CanCon, you know, if you hire mostly CMPA members or work with the Directors Guild or a union, um, you know, union members, then you can be certified CanCon and you can get a bunch of money and you can get preferential treatment. So it works for the unions when basically there's a system in place where, um, you know, there's becoming a member is advantageous to you accessing uh, Canadian cultural funds. Um, you know, that world hasn't been relevant to the digital first creators until now, you know, until they start talking about um, giving algorithmic preference to certified CanCon content, which means that if you're, you know, a musician and you're not a part of the Musicians Guild in Canada, you're at an algorithmic disadvantage. Um, this is this is this is not practical. This cannot happen, um, and we have to do everything in our power to to point this out. It, you know, because the the end game and what they're trying to do is say, listen, we want more Canadian content to get to Canadians, but there's a lack of institutional knowledge. They don't even understand how an algorithm works. And if you start forcing content that people haven't asked for into their stream on whatever platform they want, um, that's going to hurt whatever content you do that to. So there's a double, bit of a double-edged sword there where they don't even understand the negative consequences or the risks of promoting CanCon this way. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point and, a, and I think a good opportunity to segue into C10. You know, it was obviously promoted and whatever follow-on bill we get will be promoted by the government as a key support for creators. Uh, I think I know the answer to this, but were digital first creators consulted? Uh, were you given an opportunity as this, especially when they were first crafting the bill and potential amendments, were you given the opportunity to provide your views during the committee process? No, absolutely not. And you know, to their credit, um, <laughs> where it's due, I don't know that when the bill was being crafted, when the bill was initially being crafted, when, it, when the bill was initially tabled, um, I don't know that there was a lot in there for us to consult on. Again, the proverbial us. Um, you know, there really wasn't uh, an, there really wasn't a downside effect to user generated content and, and content being uploaded on platforms. So they had no real reason to consult with us, other than you know we we probably have a perspective on the broadcast industry that could be helpful to Canadian discovery. Um, but no, we weren't consulted at all. Um, and then when four point one was removed. Uh, it was too late. We, you know, witnesses were over, so they could dramatically change the bill, affected tens of thousands of Canadian creators, and then said, "Oh, sorry, you could have called your witnesses, but we dramatically changed the bill after." No, I mean it's. I think when you when you combine what you said earlier about the impact that these creators have in terms of exporting Canadian culture, creating economic activity, new jobs, new opportunities, new voices, and to think that they just aren't even part of that discussion for the bill. Uh, it's, I think, quite remarkable. You know, had they had you been asked, uh, what would you have said? 
uh, about the bill, I suppose, I guess, both before and after. <laughs> There's both the before the removal of 4.1 and then the after. Yeah, so I, I think before the bill, you know, and talking to a lot of creators uh, and, and some people, some friends in the traditional industry, there's no doubt that the Broadcasting Act needs to be updated. Um, it, but the problem with the bill is that they talk about this creation of a level playing field. Um, you know, people are, are uploading content on YouTube and they're too successful. So we need to place restrictions on them so they are, you know, as unsuccessful as we are is essentially how the bill reads. So I, from our perspective, before the bill was tabled, I would have a real conversation with, with the committee and with Heritage about updating the Broadcasting Act so maybe some of the unions and some of the traditional broadcasters don't have as many restrictions on them to allow them to compete internationally, um, you, you know, change what the definition of CanCon so they can acquire more content. There's tons of content out there, but you know, the, the broadcasters themselves are a little bit hamstrung in making sure that they have a certain amount of deemed and approved Canadian content. So we, we just would have lent our expertise on how discovery works and how, um, you know, how best to move, move forward to actually enable more Canadian voices instead of saying, you guys are too successful, get on down here with us. Yeah. Now you hinted at it a moment ago around algorithms, but discoverability, of course, became one of the the big issues once 4.1 was removed. And then there was, of course, this debate over whether or to what extent user-generated content was going to be regulated under the bill. Uh, and, you know, there were those that argued, well, digital first creators, like any other creator, want to find audiences, surely they'll be happy to have a regulator step in and essentially mandate that, the, that those discoverability requirements. You know, does, uh, does a discoverability model involving, let's say, a CRTC-type regulated mandate around algorithms work? Uh, no, absolutely not, and for a number of reasons. Um, one, the, the, gov the government seems to be under some kind of impression that they're going to pass this, this bill, and then the CRTC is going to call in YouTube or TikTok or Snapchat, um, and they're going to say, okay, show us your algorithm. Honestly, this is a conversation I have with the government. Don't don't your your creators want to understand how the algorithm works? The answer is yes, and the answer is nobody at YouTube knows how the algorithm works. There's no one person that holds the keys to you know sophisticated AI. So, what happens then is that you know the government took this approach of well, we just want to surface more Canadian content, but what that means is unnaturally. Um, promoting content within the algorithm. And if you unnaturally promote videos to people who don't want to see them on any platform um, and they either click off or they downvote it or they don't watch it or they don't want you know, something that's recommended for it, that all has a negative impact on the video. So, so even in their perfect scenario where they're giving algorithmic preference to SOCAN approved content, um, it's going to hurt, not help. And they don't understand this. They don't have the institutional knowledge to understand it. And you know, I think that goes back to the other problem of just a lack of, you know, they're trying to tackle a very modern problem with outdated um, uh, traditional solutions. Well, we'll just, you know, we'll call the Google algorithm before us and the TikTok algorithm before us, and then everybody will know what's going on. Um, unfortunately, things don't work that way. You know, and I will say, you know, Creators have a problem with the algorithm themselves, but it is what it is, and it's equal across the board. You know, the algorithm doesn't make wake up one morning and make a decision that one video is going to go viral. It's not how it works. But, you know, the bargain has been made with those algorithms, and now you're going to have a layer of government on top of it where they're saying, um, you know, now the algorithm is going to behave this way plus the way we want it to. It's just a recipe for disaster. It can't work. So those are some of the ideas about what, what we ought to be thinking about in terms of certified CanCon and the like. What would you like to see in, in a new BLC-10 itself? Uh, 4.1 has to go back in. Um, the heritage and some government officials have said user-generated content is not in the bill. It is. Um, as, long as, as long as there's algorithmic manipulation in the bill, user-generated content is in the bill. And you cannot separate the two, and they should stop talking about that. Um, any funding from the from the platforms to 
into, into whatever system they decide to put it in needs to go to creators that use those platforms. The, there's no universe where YouTube, TikTok, and Snapchat should be funding their competition. It should go into a pot for the creators that use those, those platforms. Um, and it, you, know, you can't legislate this, but definitely an increase in institutional knowledge. We can't have these conversations with the CRTC when there's nobody at the CRTC that even understands um, you know, the world that we operate and we live in you know, brand deals and algorithms is just so different from the traditional, if they're hell bent on legislating them the same way, there needs to be a, a different collection of voices at the table. So you start that, that there is a recognition of the need for, uh, or the, the benefits that would come from, from an updating of the broadcasting act. What do you think the government should be focusing on? Well, I, you know, at its base level, I don't think the government should be focused on the declining revenues of unions and lobbies um, and what that means for the Canadian culture sector. What they should actually be focused on is the enabling of Canadian voices and Canadian storytelling. And I had this conversation with Heritage. You know, there's a space here. I, you know, I think it was one of the block, um, the block ministers and committee. And I, Michael, I never expected to spend every Friday afternoon listening to heritage meetings. <laughs> it, it wasn't in my things to do in 2021. But yeah, one me of them, neither. <laughs> <laughs> one of them mentioned, um, you know, maybe once we pass this bill, you know, some of our creators will find more success on YouTube. Uh, and I actually, I think that's fair, but it's not going to happen because you're going to pass a bill. The government can't legislate success in a global algorithm. But what we can do is start updating our programs and investing our programs into um, digital first activities. Right now, you can't get any money to create a web series and release it on YouTube because you don't have a broadcast deal in Canada. So you have to get a deal with the broadcaster in order to access this money to create your content. I think if, if, you know, if Quebec or Alberta was serious about um, promoting their content creators, Let's, let's have a serious discussion about updating the CMF. Let's have a serious discussion about um, having some of, these, some of these organizations do workshops, hire experts to train people on you know, how to do the online thing better. Uh, what they're trying to do is just say, here, government, talk to Google and make our stuff more popular. I think that's, that's, a, that's a fair way to characterize it based on certainly what we've seen from some of the groups. So it does seem, notwithstanding sort of your perspective on some of the best ways to, to move forward and the opposition that we saw, there will be some bill uh, that returns probably sooner rather than later based on some of the commitments the government made uh, during the election campaign. How are digital first creators gearing up this time around? Yeah, so I, it's been a bit of an education process for us uh, and creators because success hasn't been predicated on the government in the past. We, a lot of creators haven't really paid attention. Um, we've taken this time to put into place, um, you know, some, some education and some workshops and we've done some webinars, uh, but I will say that we are launching uh, an organization called Digital First Canada um, to kind of organize the thoughts and opinions of Digital First content creators and artists. Um, I, I was resident to do so because I don't think you know, I don't think you can represent fairly um, the diversity of content creators, but it is clear um, that the government is only going to listen to a group or, or an organization. So we, with our partners, um, some industry partners, uh, and certainly creators are launching Digital First Canada. You can go to digitalfirstcanada.ca to sign up for more information, um, but we'll be organizing some of those thoughts and opinions and responding to papers and having our voices heard. Um, hopefully in committee meetings going forward. Scott, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Michael. That's the Law Bites podcast for this week. If you have comments, suggestions, or other feedback, write to lawbites at pobox.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at lawbitespod or Michael Geist at mgeist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The Law Bites podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. 
Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening and see you next time.